Thank you for joining us in another one of the mobility uh, series for this fall. So on this occasion, we have the quantum people with Alex Chesney, who is actually a occupational therapist. Uh, she's placed here in Texas, and she will be talking to us about all the different uh, opportunities with power scooters that they have. And hopefully we have some good questions at the end. So uh, let's get started. Alex? All right. Yeah, thanks everyone. And Stephanie is also on. Oh, Stephanie yes. is one of our um, quantum rehab ambassadors. So she is an end user. She uses one of our chairs and has the disability empower her network and is a great resource as well, who is probably going to chime in here and there with just some things too. She notices as, you know, somebody that is using our chair in her day-to-day -day life and can kind of chime in on some of that real world experience um, in our equipment. So let me share my screen with y'all. Um, so like you mentioned, I am an occupational therapist by background. I worked at an inpatient neurological rehab facility here in Houston. So that is my passion. Um, and there I did prescribe seating and wheeled mobility. So today I'm going to kind of talk through the way I would with anybody of when you are debating what type of equipment is going to work best for you, how to know what your options are, the general thought process behind different pieces of equipment and what they're maybe appropriate for, what they're helping you for. Um, it's always a collaborative process. So just make sure, you know, you're advocating for yourself, ask questions. There's never any dumb questions. Um, ask what's going to help you feel the most comfortable. And we're always looking at what's going to help you be the most independent. So when we start kind of with this idea of picking equipment, it can be very overwhelming of there's all these choices and um, maybe you're still walking some, or maybe you have a manual wheelchair. Somebody has said, here, I've got one in my garage. Here you go. Um, you know, there's a lot of different things we want. If you are walking still to keep, you know, your energy conservation for that and keep promoting that, but you never want to be too burned out or fatigued that you can't enjoy things during your day. So when we look at this algorithm of picking the proper equipment for what you need, we're looking at what helps you go from, you know, point A to point B in your day in a safe, timely and efficient manner, because we're all going somewhere to do something. So, you know, I don't sprint every time I go to the restroom or my kitchen, you know, I'm just going to go there because I have a purpose of what I want to accomplish when I'm there. So your any equipment you're using should really work for you, not be physically exhausting. It shouldn't be a workout. It should just get you where you want to go because you want to do something. So when we look at this algorithm, you know, there's different purposes of each piece of equipment for maybe what we're trying to do with our day-to-day -day lives. So when they look at equipment or we're talking about equipment, we're talking about mobility assistive equipment that's reasonable and necessary. And it's usually focused on you being able to complete what's referred to as MRADLs or mobility related activities of daily living. Meaning I got to get somewhere to do something. So for example, Let's say I have a walker. Maybe I'm using my walker or my rollator and I get to my kitchen and I want to start cooking a meal, but my balance is maybe a little off. And so I can't let go of my walker to start cooking my meal because I'm not safe and I'm off balance and I have to sit down. Well, that means my mobility equipment isn't supporting me and participating in these activities in my daily routine. So we want to be able to make sure we're meeting the needs of being able to participate in what's meaningful to you um, throughout your day. So with any type of gate aid or gate device, um, they're great. You know, they can help you keep some balance and mobility if you're trained on them properly, obviously, you know, making sure you're safe. But a lot of it too is just making sure you're conserving your energy. You're staying up and participating in the day. We don't want to be using any piece of equipment. And these are all kind of general listings of considerations, whether it's a gate aid or manual wheelchair. When we're talking about things that require a lot of physical effort, we just want to look at, okay, are we using, you know, a walker or manual wheelchair, but then we're getting so fatigued and burnout out from using that we're going back to bed a lot during the day. And maybe we have to take a really long nap and we never were doing that before. Whereas, no, I want to, I'm an energetic person. I want to stay up. I want to participate in my day, or I don't want to be so tired at the end of the day. I can't join my family for dinner or whatever's meaningful for you. We want to make sure, okay, is it too much of an, of an energy demand? It's, it's too difficult. Um, maybe you use it for short distances or to get up and walk to the bathroom, but maybe you need some other device to kind of support you throughout the entirety of a day so you can stay up and participate in what you want. 
So that's what we're always kind of looking at is how can we stay up and participate in our days in a way that's the most meaningful and, you know, helps you take advantage of the full time of a day and using, you know, the strength and independence you have, but balancing, you know, some changes that might happen in balance or your strength or your endurance over time. So similar thoughts with manual wheelchairs, you know, there's very basic manual wheelchairs and we are not a a company that has manual wheelchairs, but there's a lot out there and we have different supports that go with manual wheelchairs. If you're needing a manual wheelchair and this is your primary means of mobility you're using all day, you really are going to want a customized manual wheelchair. There's different types. You would want something that's actually called a K5. They use K codes to classify these, but you'd want something that is ultra lightweight that can be adjusted and configured to you. Anything we're going to be using all day as our mobility should be able to be customized to us. Okay. So that is very important so that we make sure that it's efficient for you with manual wheelchairs. There's adjustability of this back axle that only is achievable on those ultra lightweight customized manual wheelchairs. And again, that's so that we can make it more efficient for you, protect your shoulders and make sure you're able to get to and participate in your tasks in your day-to-day routine. So then sometimes there's a consideration of things like a scooter, or they call them a POV, a power-operated vehicle. So scooters are great to bridge um, like an energy conservation gap or an endurance gap. So a lot of times these are really intended for somebody to use less than two hours a day. So that's why you usually see, you know, scooters a lot of times at the grocery store or maybe at Disneyland or Home Depot. It's for endurance and energy conservation. So a lot of times they don't have the same, you know, stability or characteristics to be used for a full day. Um, If you're really active and going around, definitely have to make sure you can manage getting your legs in and out of a scooter. There's not really any positioning supports. It's just very kind of basic seating. So you you want to make sure you don't have any skin breakdown, any wounds, or need any better support to feel comfortable in your equipment or to feel like you're not having to work your trunk muscles if you, if you get fatigued very easily. Um, so scooters can be great to kind of bridge that endurance gap and be more of a motorized option. And then you have power wheelchairs. So with power wheelchairs, a lot of times the goal here, and I know there is usually, you know, sometimes there's a negative connotation around power chairs of, oh my gosh, now this means I'm going to lose my strength or I'm not working out hard. Um, No, remember our mobility is supposed to be efficient for us. So a power wheelchair, the way I see it is an extension of your body. If your body's having difficulty, you know, with your mobility or being able to have that energy to do the same tasks you were doing before, this is an extension of that for you to be able to participate more. It doesn't mean you're not maybe using a gate aid. Maybe you have a walker you're still using, or maybe you have a manual wheelchair you had before you're still, you know, alternating between, but that the power wheelchair has some positioning and seating features that maybe help you be more comfortable during the day and not return to bed. Or it has those kind of higher performance, you know, motors and the speed and the battery life to keep up with you all day in your daily living. So it's really about, does it help you participate in the things you want to do during your day that are meaningful? And just know there's different types of power wheelchairs out there. Today, what we're going to talk about that Quantum primarily has are group three power wheelchairs. So group three power wheelchairs are complex power wheelchairs that are specifically designed typically for those with a diagnosis of any sort of neurological condition, myopathy, or congenital skeletal deformity. So those are created knowing some of the diagnoses features of of those kind of various kind of catch-all overarching diagnoses of that somebody's going to need some extra support, you know, to continue being as independent as possible. Your group two chairs is a is considered a basic chair. So it has limitations in how far it can go on a full charge. It has um, limitations in the speed it's going to reach or the obstacles it can climb. And it's only really going to have maybe two power functions, which would be tilt. And I'll show the, some slides later. So some tilt and then your legs being able to elevate out. So that's available, but the huge thing with group three chairs that we're talking about today that's a complex power wheelchair is they have certain standards or requirements. So at a minimum, 
the maximum speed these chairs have to go to is four and a half miles per hour. That's not at random. That's the average brisk walking pace of somebody who's ambulatory. And so the idea behind that is that this chair needs to keep up with your, your peers. You know, if you're getting to a meeting on time, if you're crossing the street, we want to be timely. And so that is a minimum requirement. A lot of these chairs go six miles per hour plus. So as a top speed, so it does meet that standard. It can go longer distances on a full battery charge. And then one of the biggest things is drive wheel suspension. So if you think about this, you know, this has to do, and I'm going to kind of go to our next slide to talk about this is this has to do with taking away that vibration you're going to feel from your environment. So if you thought about us having vehicles or riding in a car without suspension and you had to go down a road of construction with potholes, it would be a bumpy ride and we'd be flying all over the place. We'd be so uncomfortable. We'd be like, we're never going down that road again. So similar with this, if somebody is using their power wheelchair all day and you're going over different terrains or you have thresholds in your house or you're going to go out in the community or your backyard or your front yard, there's a lot of different vibrations going on there. And we don't want that coming up to you when you're sitting. You're not going to be comfortable. You're not going to want to use your chair. And it's going to deter you from, you know, getting out in the community or getting out within your house around obstacles. So what this vibration does, this dampening, it takes away, you'll kind of see springs on these chairs. It's not just a spring. There's actually like an oil damp dampened gas strut in there. So it absorbs this vibration in the base. So it doesn't come up and kind of jolt you around, which can make a big difference as far as staying in your position you want to be in, being comfortable, not getting kind of bounced around and maybe losing your balance. So it just keeps you very stable and supported. And this continues to improve over time. So our chairs that were older you know, not as great suspension when you compare it to the chairs that are newer within the last few years. So this is constantly being looked at and updated. And even on our front wheel drive chair, which we'll talk about a little bit more, this has motocross grade suspension on it. So we've really looked into how do we make things smooth and comfortable for somebody to not have to think about that part of, you know, their mobility device. So yeah, if you want, you want to chime in, Stephanie, go yeah, for it. I was so um, I've been a chair user since I was, well, a power chair user since I was 12. I have been uh, throughout all of the devices that Alex has talked about. And I will say that suspension changing over the years is probably one of my favorites. My test is always the coffee test because when I go in to get a coffee, I'm usually not going through the drive through I'm going down a sidewalk, going into the place, getting my coffee and coming back. If I can't get back to my home without spilling my coffee because of the bumps in the sidewalk, we know that they have failed the coffee test. And I will say that until I was in my early 20s and to date myself, I am now in 34, uh, I the coffee test failed every single time. Um, and I specifically remember going to, into my law school with like stains on my pants because of the coffee just jolting as you're just trying to get to class. So I'm really impressed with the suspension we have now. And I will say that as beneficial it is for your body, it is also beneficial anytime you're carrying any hot liquids. <laughs> no, that's perfect. And that's a good point, Stephanie. I mean, that's what it makes it practical for everybody. And just know, you know, as somebody who is looking at the equipment that you want to try, we're going to talk through the various, you know, bases we have. Just know you as a as a client, as a patient, as a consumer, you have a right to try all the, these pieces of equipment. Okay. Don't ever feel like somebody is just telling you this is what we're going to get you. Now, if you feel okay with what they've explained and you are one of those people that's just like, sure, you know, I trust you. That sounds great. That's fine. But just know you have a right to trial your equipment in your environment. People will come. That's why we have manufacturer reps. They will come bring this to your house for you to trial it. You can say you want to trial a majority. I know we're talking about quantum today, but you could say you want to try our competitors. You want to try a quantum, a permobile, a sunrise. You could try all three, drive them around and make the decision of what works for you. So just know, you know, all of this is unique to you. At the end of the day, this process is about selecting what works best for you and know you do have an option and that you need to, you know, sometimes if people try to keep pushing you into something, advocate for yourself until they're able to give you an explanation of, you know, maybe why they're, you know, recommending that one thing or kind of wanting to push you towards that one thing, you know, just advocate for yourself and your needs and know you have options. So what we're talking about is our optional lineup 
today. So we have an edge three. This is a mid wheel drive base. We'll talk about what that means um, more in detail in a little bit, but this is your traditional mid wheel drive base. So this base is 24 inches wide. Okay. A lot of people get worried about power wheelchairs being super wide. Just know many times your widest part of your chair is actually where your armrests are. Because sometimes people like to have their armrests out to the side a little further. So sometimes it's not even that your base is, is that big. It depends, again, on your body and where you feel comfortable. Um, in general, though, just know compared to manual chairs, sometimes people think also a manual chair is going to be narrower. Many times the power chair base is actually narrower than the manual wheelchair. Once you kind of have those wheels set up the way you want and you have your hand rims, so you you just, again, have to try these in your environment you're looking at. So that's your traditional mid-wheel drive chairs, your edge, your stretto. We're going to go through some details. This is our narrow mid-wheel drive base. So stretto in Italian just means narrow. Um, and so this base, there's a 12 and a half inch drive wheel that you see here. It's a little kind of baby. It's a, a skinnier wheel. That makes it, you know, about 20.5 inches wide. So we shaved off, you know, almost four inches. And then you can get the more standard wheel, like you see here, the 14 inch drive tire, that makes it 21 and a half. Um, so just know there's different options. Now this narrow tire on the stretto, I would say this is a great option if you're inside your house 95% of the time, you know, you're not really leaving to go many places. You really are kind of a homebody who likes to be at home. You do stuff and hang out with your family at home. You watch TV and you like being at home. You can go outside to the mailbox and get your mail or, you know, your back patio and that kind of stuff. But if you're really somebody that gets out in the community a lot, that's when I say, no, 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 please go with the larger tire, you know, the 14 inch tire, that's just going to perform way better with those various terrains. So, you know, if your family likes to go on outings a lot, you go to church, you go to the grocery store, you go to the zoo, really go for, you know, that 14 inch drive tire versus if you're at home all the time and it's a nice smooth tile floor and you're just wanting really tight access in your, in your house, then you could consider that 12 and a half inch drive tire. And then there's the forefront too. So this is a front wheel drive chair. And we'll talk about that. So when we say that we're talking about where the larger wheel is in relation to the base. So the larger wheels on the middle and these, and then the larger wheels on the front on this one. So this is just some information. So that edge three, that's that traditional mid-wheel drive base, you know, these are made um, for adults, for adult users. So 300 pound weight capacity, there are versions that are heavy duty that go to a higher weight capacity, like 450 pounds. Your speed, you can get up to six, 0.25 miles per hour. So you can really get some speed on this. Um, and then you can drive with your seat elevator. So what we refer to on our systems as eye level, because it brings you up to eye level, this will go 12 inches and you can still drive four and a half miles per hour. So if you're crossing a street, you need to do so in that timely manner and you want people to see you, you can cross. Or if you're in a room and you're talking to people and you just want to go across the room and you want to drive an eye level, then you can. Um, it does have all the available seating features that we'll talk about and it has tons of color options that you can customize whatever color you want. That's always my favorite part is what color do people want um, when you go to select this and there's various obviously sizing. So the stretto is almost the same as far as the edge, as far as like some of the requirements. Um, so it can still do 300 pounds. And you're going to have a little bit difference as far as the width you can go, because obviously we don't want to be wider than our base. So, you know, if you are getting to 20 inches wide at your hips, then we might have a conversation about, well, what are you planning to do in your chair? What type of terrain do you encounter? Maybe we would recommend the edge base as far as its performance versus the stretto. So that's where you just have these conversations about what's important to you. What's your home environment like? And you can try both and see which one you like better. Um, so you can still go um, 6.25 miles per hour. Your speed is a little restricted because that base is narrow when you have that seat elevate feature. So you can still drive three and a half miles per hour um, with that 12 inch seat elevator. So this is kind of just side by side. So these are those really tiny skinny wheels on the Shredo, the 12 and a half inch. And then this is the edge base. So it is a lot narrower for home accessibility. Um, and this is, these are just some videos so you can see. So of course everyone wants to know, well, how does it do outside? So it does fine. This is an adult 
gentlemen, obviously try to link it out in some very loose gravel. This is with the 14 inch drive tire. So that larger drive tire. So he does fine. He navigates through this. Now, if he told me he was going to drive through that every day, I'd probably be talking to him about a different chair because that's really rough terrain to encounter every day on the Stretto. And the Stretto does have a little bit narrower front caster wheels. Um, it does fine, like you saw, but it, again, you just want to tell somebody, you know, how aggressive are you? Do you drive through that every day? Are you driving on a really uneven sidewalk because they haven't repaired it? Do you like off-roading? Um, so just let us know, but it can do that. But these are some of the primary reasons many people have looked at these. For example, accessibility, getting into a van, um, being able to really kind of do a 360 degree turn versus like a 10 point turn if you do get a modified vehicle. Or this young lady was really excited because she wanted to sit in the front passenger side and she wasn't able to do that previously. And so she was like, no, it's a rite of passage. I want to sit in the passenger seat or up front. And she could do that with the narrower um, base of this chair. So just showing how easy it maneuvers. And then this is our rep, Andrew, out in Arizona. We were actually at somebody's house seeing if it could fit in their bathroom. So this is a typical bathroom, 26-inch wide door, doesn't have the door removed. And we were able to get in, turn around between where the vanity is and the commode and that little tiny space and get back out. So that is where kind of the stretto has really been something people want to look at as far as not having to do some home modifications or fit in maybe some tighter spaces. So mid-wheel drive is what that edge base and that stretto were. So when you talk about these mid-wheel drive chairs, the reason a lot of times people will select mid-wheel drive is it does have a very tight turning radius. And it's the most intuitive. I'm just going to kind of click through some of these because I'm just going to talk through them. So it's the most intuitive if you've previously been ambulatory and walking because it lines up with our inner ear. So it's very natural for us of our center of gravity to rotate from the middle. So that is, you know, an advantage of it. It does really well in kind of smaller spaces and climbing obstacles. You have good stability because you have these front caster wheels and rear caster wheels. So you have a lot of stability on the ground. The only time you kind of have to be careful with that is let's say it just downpoured and rained and you want to drive through the grass. Well, if the grass is really like boggy and muddy, then what can happen sometimes is your, your middle wheel kind of digs or your front casters and rear casters dig in and it raises your center wheel. So it's something we call high centering. So you just have to be cognizant of like, maybe I shouldn't drive through like the mud that I could get stuck in. Um, so, but it does really well um, with tracking and kind of going over obstacles and it's easier to turn. It's very intuitive to turn. You kind of can drive down the middle of a hallway. You can turn in the middle of a doorway and you're going to make it versus with a front wheel or a rear wheel. It's a little bit different strategy. And we do have rear wheel drive chairs. So we're going to talk about front wheel next, but rear wheel would look exactly like this, except for the wheels are reversed. Rear wheel is kind of um, where power chairs started when they were even initially created. So many times those that are using a rear wheel drive chair is somebody who grew up with one and started using one. And so they like that rear wheel drive. A lot of times if you've had a rear wheel drive chair, you don't want to change. That being said, they're still available and there are newer renditions of them. We're going to have a newer one come out because there's still a need, but we don't have it in here today to talk about because it's not the most popular or the most common. It's the least intuitive because if you think about it, your point of access of moving is from behind. So you have this big front end that's swinging around and it is kind of the largest, more most robust type of chair. Um, so that is available though. So now if you like, for whatever reason, rear wheel drive, I can't drive it. I can't make it through a doorway. That would not be the chair for me, but there are some people that drive really well with that. Or if you have familiarity with any type of equipment, machinery, truck, whatever that was rear wheel drive, that might work really well for you. So front wheel drive, this is our forefront two. So on this chair, it has a seat elevator. This one only goes 10 inches versus our mid wheel drives go 12. And you can still drive, you know, three and a half miles per hour. If you have 
HD just means heavy duty, meaning it is a more heavy duty package if weight capacity is up to 450 pounds. So you do have a reduction in your speed. You can go, but it has a bunch of sizing ranges. And then this chair does have like a smart tracking technology. So sometimes in the The past, when you had front wheel drive, there would be something called caster flutter, where these casters would kind of have to flutter to track straight. That's eliminated with technology today with having this smart traction control. So it has gyroscopes in it that tell it where to orient those casters to go straight for you when you are driving. So it is a different experience with front wheel drive. It can make very tight turns around corners. But when you're thinking about turns with front wheel drive, front wheel drive is like 90 degree angles. Okay. So you have to clear your back end where I usually tell people, we just got a lot of junk in the trunk. We got some stuff that's got to swing around. So you really have to hug up close to a wall of a door. Maybe you're going to enter into, and you have to initiate that turn a little bit before you get to the doorway. So the back end can swing around. Now, once people learn how to drive front wheel drive, you can drive drive it very, very intuitively. It's just different than maybe what we would naturally kind of expect. It climbs obstacles really well because you have these larger front drive tires. Um, These articulate or kind of move so you can get over obstacles. Now, the general rule of thumb, a lot of people ask, well, what can I climb? So the general rule of thumb for safety is whatever the diameter is of your wheel down, you're safe to climb. And all these chairs will have like ratings for that. Now, whether or not whatever you choose to climb, I'm not saying it won't make it, but the general rule of thumb is from your diameter down. So that's why the front wheel drive is made to be a little more robust of what you can climb over because you're pulling with that motor over various terrain. Um, um, yeah, go go for it. Oh, yeah. I just, uh, this is Lynn. Uh, thank you, yeah. Alex. I had a gentleman who's raised his hand and I think he wants to ask a question. Craig? Uh, yes. Um, on that uh, previous slide, I don't know if you're coming back to it. But, yeah, uh, it I talked can. about in the front wheel uh, drive, um, the three standard power options. Is that on all chairs or just the, the up front two? Oh, so this standard single and multiple power? Yeah. What is that? So what that means is these are code sets that you'll see sometimes when people go to order it. So standard would just be if like the coding they use, if somebody just bought the chair without it having any type of like power seating on it versus single power always means single power is in reference to a chair having tilt and the legs that move. And then multi-power is typically what is being ordered for these complex chair because that combines your tilt of your chair your recline, opening that back angle, your okay. legs kicking out, and you can get that seat elevate feature or anterior tilting. And I'm going to show you what all those features look like. But okay. that just means the the code of the chair supports all of these kind of more advanced seating movements. Thank you. I didn't know if that was the drive system. Thank you. Yeah, no. Yeah, good question. Okay. So these are just examples you can see of front wheel drive. So ironically, I go to Arizona a lot. So same gravel you saw earlier, you get to see again. So this is a front wheel drive chair pulling through. So it does great pulling through that gravel. Oh, this is a different area. So it's like a little more rugged over here and transitioning. And then this is our um, rep out there kind of showing if you wanted to go off-roading and you had a huge divot or big hole you came across, Gonna, it's going to bounce you around, but you're going to pull through it fine because it has that larger wheel to kind of really pull that system through. Or again, here's a good uneven terrain example. Loose gravel, smooth concrete, kind of holes and divots there. And you can see, although he's going over this, you don't see him jostling around too bad. So that's the suspension helping keep him balanced while you see the base does take a lot of that kind of brunt of the force, but his trunk stays relatively calm. So that is what front wheel drive kind of looks like, or, or it's kind of made for a little bit more aggressive terrain. So what you're seeing here is power positioning. These systems come with power positioning. Now, when these have to be justified or identified for you, it needs to be, what are you using it for? So some of them have 
key features they are utilized for versus others, you just say unique, very unique situation. So just so I can point out in this picture, this would be tilt where your system is tilting. It's not changing your joint angles. It's tilting the system in space. So with this, and I'm going to click through the slides and I can make a handout to send y'all. But with this, the main thing people use this for is to redistribute pressure. So to tilt back, get some weight off of your bottom, you know, stretch out your shoulders, get more comfortable, just change position. We all like to change position during the day. It can help with if you are, you know, kind of managing your pants in your chair, you can kind of use gravity to help you and wiggle your pants kind of down or up. Um, that's very OT of me, but that's how we kind of train people that you could maybe kind of use gravity to your advantage. You have recline. So this would be recline. We always recommend recline with your legs because if you're going to lay fully out, you have to have those power legs go out and your backrest open up. So those actually change your joint angles at your hip and at the back of your knee. So you can get a nice big elongated stretch along with you can take a nap like this. You can get dressed like this or a caregiver can assist you or if you have for whatever reason you need to do some kind of um, kind of bathroom management, bowel or bladder management from your chair, you can kind of lay out and manage it that way. Um, if you if people are using self catheterization for their bladder management, they might need this position to perform that. Um, so very, very functional position. And then there's a few more. So tilt is exactly what we just said. Your system is tilting back. And we know this helps with your trunk balance, with your with swallowing, breathing, and again, shifting that weight off your bottom, which is huge to protect your skin. Then tilt and like recline, sorry, and your legs, obviously stretching. So those are dynamic that open up. They can help with transfers, you know, bowel and bladder, again, being comfortable. None of us sit and stay in the same position. So you shouldn't have to in your power chair. And then using both is really what's recommended. So that tilt and recline is what's recommended together to get optimal pressure relief and just have all the options. And then additionally, you have features like seat elevation that raises your seat vertically and anterior tilt. So seat elevation raises and lowers the system. And I am going to play this video that features Stephanie. <laughs> um, so this video is fantastic just so you can see this is Stephanie um, performing various activities with and without a seat elevator. So I really do love this because it shows, you know, she can do a lot of these tasks without it, some not. And it really makes a big difference, not only in being able to perform a task, but also the amount of effort and energy and trunk reaching and straining that kind of comes into play with, with doing tasks. So it can make it, you know, way more functional throughout your day to reach and protect your shoulders. So that's kind of another nerdy therapy fact is that, you know, for every one time you reach overhead, if you're standing, somebody who's in a seated position or in a wheelchair has reached five times more. So you really are reaching way more overhead and your shoulders can get really tired and fatigued and you're using them for transfers and reaching and functional tasks. So we want to preserve that shoulder strength and endurance. So tasks can just look completely different with this seat elevation feature and not. So those are just some examples. And then this is from Resna. Everyone can look up Resna and you have access to these papers. Anyone can kind of join and they just talk about facilitating reach and transfers, but also just for you to have, you know, eye level communication with your peers. If you want to go out to dinner and sit at a bar top or a tall tabletop, you should be able to do that. You're socializing, um, safety with crossing the street. So there's a lot of functional reasons why somebody would utilize seat elevation. And then anterior tilt. So anterior tilt is bringing the rear end of our seating system forward. So what's required, you have to have all those seating features we talked about, but now you also have this articulation feature that will take that foot plate down to the floor for transfers, for stand pivot transfers. This is brand new. This is something that just came out. Um, so if you if you have one of our chairs and you don't have this or don't know what I'm talking about, that's why. Is this just came out, this anterior tilt, and it has this foot platform. So again, what that kind of looks like is it's going to bring you more forward. Now, you do have to have safety supports if you have a system that's going more forward, like 20 or 30 degrees. So you have to have knee supports. And then there is this chest bar you'll see here. 
Now the chest bar is not meant for somebody to lean against it. It's there kind of as a block and you can kind of, you know, rest on it as you're reaching. But if you are lacking that trunk control, that's when we recommend something like a chest strap that's going to help hold you in place. So you don't have to worry about losing balance. Used a lot for transfers. So just to reduce strain on the upper extremity and help somebody facilitate standing. Because, you know, in therapy, if you've ever done therapy, a lot of times we're always trying to work on getting off of the chair or raising a mat. We're trying to go from a higher surface to take away some of that strength requirement from your hips and your knees and kind of those muscles of your lower extremities. And this just shows the differences of what's available. So 10 degrees, 20 degrees, and 30 degrees. So more and more based on what would help support you. And then lastly, just clicking through a few accessories to know that exist. So there's things like transfer handles that you can hold on to to help you transfer out of your chair or reposition yourself. Or honestly, I like these because they could be a weapon. I know that's sad to say, but they are very heavy and robust. And if you needed to, you take one of those off if somebody's bothering you. Um, so there's transfer handles. There are upper extremity supports. So there are things like um, arm troughs. So this one's really soft and padded and gelled versus we have Autobach that's a little bit more of like a firmer rubber that's that has a good mold to it. There's elbow blocks so that your arms don't fall off the, the chair if you're tilting back or kind of these side arm supports. There's a tray so you can keep your functional items or your iPad and that kind of stuff close to you. And then just know there's different ways to drive the chair. We're not going to go in depth on this, but you do not have to use the joystick that comes on the chair. You can drive with your chin, your head, your breath, your eyes. There's lots of different ways to drive. So just know if you ever use a joystick and it's difficult, you're not stuck with that. This is the range of joysticks. So a standard joystick is about 250 grams of force. You can go as light as eight and a half. So there's a lot of differences of how you can use these devices and mount them, okay? So you can have them in trays. So just know if something doesn't work for you, just say it's not working and it's really hard. And we have a lot of tricks up our sleeve to make it easier. There's different toppers that can go on top of your joystick. And then just so you can see an example, this is a gentleman driving with a chin control. And he used this for endurance, drove around his whole neighborhood. So he's just using his chin to drive. You're good. That was my backpack. And he has different supports. So he has these arm supports. And so he's driving with his chin. So it's whatever works for you and customizes how you're able to stay independent. All right, go ahead. And these are just switches. So I'll just end there so we can answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very yeah. much. Um, Manuel, before we get started, is there anything you'd like to say before I start going through the Q&A? No, I think that's that's a lot of different things that are options. So are these all these options just to start? Are these options available in, in all the different chairs or is certain chairs that have different options? How that works? They're available on all the chairs. So the biggest thing to know is that you just say if you're having difficulty with something and these options exist. Now you have to yeah. have all the chairs I showed are are those complex power chairs. So for right. Using these various driving systems, you have to have a complex chair that can handle right. the, the brains yeah. of the computer, so to speak. But all of your positioning items, those can go on tilt and space chairs, manual chairs, power chairs. Excellent. Okay. So, and I think the, some of the power, the, the control, so I think it makes sense, a lot of sense, especially for the patients here with myositis, into, uh, my, yeah, inclusion body myositis who don't have a lot of control on their hands. Yeah. So certainly many of those things help a lot. And please know a lot of it with your hands too, is there's programming. You know, I worked with clients primarily with spinal cord injury that didn't have upper extremity movement or very little, little or limited. And so there's a lot of adjustments that can be done through programming. So your job is to let us know when it's hard mm -hmm. and it's difficult to do something or it's jerky. You're never complaining. That's how we help customize that system to you. So it should not be hard. There are ways we can make okay. it easy. So let's get started here on the Q&A. Um, I've got Lori who asked a question. I think this gets to the tilt function, the forward tilt. Okay. So uh, I'm curious about the uh, the photo for the webinar. It looked like the quantum has an option to tilt with the lift. She has yeah. a stretto with a lift elevation, but does not have the forward tilt function. Yes. So that forward tilt function is brand new. Okay. That's a new seating system. You can't get it added on to oh. Oh. older systems. 
So All right. that's the question. It's completely new and there are um, changes to the system because it has um, smart sensors kind of of the system. Okay. So now you actually have memory seating available as well. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Jim Suds, IBM 04, Sudsic. <laughs> He says, my quantum strato tires always seem to spin when I am getting into the back off, uh, into the back off the transport van. Okay, and so they raised, yes, yeah, so they raised um, off the front. Or let me just say this. Okay, depending on the incline of a ramp on a van um, or any type of ramp, it depends on that incline, A, and then B, it depends on where your center of gravity is. So in that case, if you feel like they're always tipping forward, you could always reach out to your provider and ask them probably to reach out to the quantum manufacturer to come look at it. Our chairs do have center of gravity adjustment. You don't see it. It's underneath these kind of bars and they have to come adjust it and they can move your seating system of where you are in relation to this drive wheel. The further you are over this drive wheel, kind of the better the balance of the system. But it is okay that sometimes if you are going up, you will see some of the articulation of the front caster come up a little bit if it's an extreme incline. Not pop all the way, like they should not be all the way off, but they may kind of raise up a little bit due to that incline. But again, that is something that's definitely a safety thing. And so I would have your provider um, you know, come out and potentially that quantum manufacturer to look at that. Alex, I'd also add that it depends on if you're going in forward or in backward, because when you're yes. going in forward, um, particularly if there's any sort of angle, uh, you're going to be spinning a lot more frequently. And then I'm finding that uh, vans that have, like Alex said, that it, more of a uh, harder angle at the very beginning of a ramp, that's where I would get spinning tires because my chair has to figure out that it's on a new surface that's pointing in a different direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and thank you. There's one follow up from Jim. And Jim, if you have another uh, question on this that you want to ask, you're going to unmute yourself, but uh, for later on. But Jim asked also, uh, should I get lar larger tires? You well, you can't get larger casters on the front, so you can't those smaller wheels. You can't get those any larger. The only wheel that can change is that middle wheel of if you had that 12 and a half inch, you could go to the 14. So Jane asked a question. I'm confused by quantum and pride. Does pride oh. make quantum? What's the relationship there? So pride is the overarching company. So way back when pride started as this company and they primarily did scooters and, you know, lift chairs. And then the company created a rehab division and the rehab division is quantum. So quantum is kind of like pride's baby but it is a separate division. So if you ask me about scooters that are pride, I don't really know anything about them because <laughs> I am on the quantum side and I work on the rehab side. So there's okay. rehab side and then there's considered the DME side, which is durable medical equipment. And that's more of your kind of your scooters, your lift chairs, that kind of equipment. Okay. Perfect. Uh, Richard asks, uh, how much do these chairs weigh? So it depends. It depends on all those seating features you have. Um, these chairs, if you have, you know, tilt, recline, elevating legs and the seat elevator and anterior tilt, we're definitely looking at, you know, over 400 pounds if you have everything on the chair. So it really depends. It depends on, you know, not only those power actuators you get, but it also depends on, you know, the weight of your cushion. What type of backrest do you have? Um, all of those things add weight. So it is different for each chair. But if there's a certain weight capacity that you need, a lot of times that comes up at VAs. They need it to be a certain weight for kind of Bruno lifts that lift your your um, chair into a vehicle. Then you that's when they talk to the manufacturer and say, hey, the chair has to be less than 400 pounds. What can we do? And then they would say like, oh, well, if you do this, this and this, that's under 400. Um, so they do know like guesstimates depending on what you are putting on the chair. Thank you. Jim asks, how water resistant are the chairs? All right, everybody. We are not power washing our chair. We are not spraying it down with the hose. <laughs> and you can now, like if you get caught in a rainstorm, you want to have like a plastic bag or something with you to like cover your electronics. Always keep like a little, you know, grocery bag or something to cover your joystick. But 
ideally, if we can avoid driving through water, you would like to avoid driving through high water. Um, now, if you're driving through like a puddle on the side of the lock, you're fine. But yes, they are not, they're not meant to go swimming. And that's a good question for Stephanie. I thought that's like, yeah, I was like, I have any idea like driving on how water resistant they are. So I will say that I run a young girls camp out in the Adirondacks uh, where we take teenage girls with disabilities out camping for an entire week. There is, we only sleep in lean to, so there are no structures with four walls. Um, and remarkably both years that we've done this, we have been caught in significant rainstorms to one year it was um, flood advisory rain okay. and every chair the chairs were not the concern. The girls were more concerned about yeah. them being wet than about the chairs. We covered the joysticks and that's really all that we needed to do. I do always recommend that when you see a puddle, go have fun in it, like do your thing. But if it's deeper than your front caster, then don't have fun in that one because it won't result in a lot of fun. But I've I mean, I have nieces and nephews. If you think I'm not going through the puddles, like you haven't hung out with a three-year-old then. <laughs> so uh, I'm here to just give the real world perspective. Uh, I'm sure Quantum would say, please don't do that. But I'm here to say, go have fun with your puddles. Don't worry about the rain too much. you got to live your life, but do cover that joystick. Yeah, yeah. Same. Yes, you can drive through the puddles and that kind of stuff. If you're caught in a rainstorm, you're fine. Just let it dry or like pat it down when you can. And then like Stephanie said, the biggest thing is cover the joystick. That's your electronics. Okay, thank you. Uh, David has a few questions, and then uh, we've got uh, some from Lori Wong. So David uh, asks, what's the range of costs for these wheelchairs? And does uh, insurance cover some of the costs? Someone else also asked if the anterior lift was covered by Medicare. Okay, so the range of these chairs, these chairs are like vehicles. If we're talking MSRP, it is like a vehicle. So it does depend on all the seating functions you have on it. So, you know, if I was ordering a chair with, you know, tilt, recline and elevating legs, that's the most common, a power chair. I mean, we're definitely talking MSRP range is like twenty to $30,000. So these are like a vehicle. Now, that being said, yes, this is why insurance exists. So if it's Medicare, Medicare covers something 80-20, okay? And I'm going to tell you things that, that this is clinician Alex, okay? So 80-20. Now that 20%, a lot of times there's things like care credit you can use, or a lot of these providers have payment plans. Um, you can pay like $1 a month for the rest of your life and somebody cannot come repossess your home or your vehicle. Ain't nobody repoing anything. Okay. So as long as you can contribute whatever is reasonable to that 20%, you should go for what is appropriate for you to be the most independent. Um, when it comes to now, if it's primary insurance, depends on your insurance. So all these insurances, whether it's Medicare or a primary insurance, your therapist is, is writing your script. So we are justifying why you need this. Now, sometimes what will happen on things that aren't covered, like a seat elevator and like anterior tilt, we will try for them. Seat elevation is getting covered more and more. Um, with justification, it comes down to kind of transfers and independence and like functional reach and independence. We have a program called Quantum Cares. So if your therapist, you know, prescribes a seat elevator or, you know, the seat elevator is needed for part of anterior tilt, if it gets denied and you have financial hardship, there is a form you can fill out that's through the quantum rep. So your vendor would reach out to the quantum manufacturer and you can apply for quantum care. So you fill that out with your ATP, your vendor, and you just attest to, you know, they, they'll have a copy of the denial and they'll attest to, you know, these were our justifications. You're unable to afford the seat elevator, um, but it does help you functionally. And then that goes to a review committee at Quantum that looks at why you need this functionally. And I would say, I don't know of any denials. So if you really need this for you know your functional daily living, Quantum is covering seat elevators and they cover the warranty on that. They want somebody to have it if that makes you functional. Now, anterior tilt is something that we're winning. We're getting closer to the seat elevator battle. We do feel like there's been some congressional fly-ins um, really in the past few months. We do feel like seat elevation will be covered at some point within like, you know, in a year, like Medicare is going to consider it. So that's getting better. And some private insurances are covering that more and more. Um, anterior tilt, very nuanced. That one, not so much. We're going to justify it as a therapist um, if you're doing 20 or 30. Now, I will say if you're doing the 10 degrees, this slight 10 degrees, the therapist is only having to justify that elevate. 
And the 10 degrees of this system, it's called TB4, the 10 degrees comes standard. You don't have to have the initial knee block. You don't have the initial chest bar. So that one, you have a little more leverage. If you get that seat elevator covered, then it comes with the 10 degrees. When you get to 20 and 30, you do have to, that's when your therapist is having to justify, you know, exactly why you need more of that anterior tilt functionally. They'll look at it. A majority of times insurance isn't covering it. If you have secondary funding through like crime victims or different states, like we have something here called CRS in Texas. So different states have various things. If you have neurological conditions um, or if, you know, various disability associations, there's different grants and things out there that you can look into, but generally, no, that's where it's a conversation with the provider on what the out-of-pocket cost would be. Just know the out-of-pocket cost that they're going to tell you is different than what MSRP is. Okay. So that's my other clinician trick is that there are, there, there is a range of, if you pay for something up front, there is a disc, like a significant discount to that of what you would be responsible for paying for if something's not covered, but always try, you always try to justify it and fight for it. That's how we've gotten as far as we have with seat elevation. Thank you. That's great. David asked about the 14 inch wheel. Does that mean it can climb a seven inch step? And he also wants to know the quantum rep in St. Louis, Missouri. (laughs) Michael Freehill. I was going to say Mike Freehill. Mike Freehill's out in St. Louis. He's fantastic. Um, can I don't know the specifics of that. I'm going to say, no, we are not recommending your, your, your climbing a seven inch stair, um, a seven inch that's, you could, you know, you could, you could jump off a seven inch curb, um, but you can't really go. You're not going to go up seven inches. And the the name, did you say again? What, what was the name? His of name the... is Michael Freehill. Michael, Michael Freehill. Freehill. Okay. Lori, you had a question. I had a, a question about the uh, anterior lift. I just got a power chair like a couple of months ago and I could see where the anterior lift would really be beneficial. So the question that I have is, is to actually get that, like if it was going through my insurance, they may say, hey, you just got a new chair. Mm-hmm. Um, we're not going to do that. Or is there a way to actually be able to exchange the chair or how would that work? I mean, basically, yeah. you have to wait for three or five years or whatever that period is. Yes. Unfortunately, you do have to wait unless you have a medical status change. We don't want we don't want a medical status change, but yes, unless something happens and there's a medical status change and there can be a justification for why you need that feature on that system, um, then no, there's not like an exchange. And unfortunately, this like can't be added after the fact because this is a completely new chair. So our chairs that we have now or that we've had previously have something called TB3 seating. And so this isn't just the anterior tilt. There's different differences as far as some of the programmability of the system. So it changes the seating's name. So the seating is called TB4. Now TB3 doesn't go away, but TB4 is like an extra, like an additional um, to have that feature. So unfortunately, you know, on our end, it is that you have to unfortunately wait. Hmm. Wow. So sure. in, in, in order to get like a medical change or something, um, if I could get the physical therapist or whatever to say, you really need this, would that be? Yes. So it'll be considered, it pretty much has to come from a physician. So your physician would have to initiate again. You'd have to do that kind of face-to-face meeting that you have to have to start this mobility process. And the physician would have to say, you know, due to X, Y, C changes in medical status, like they would have to justify what medical status change has occurred saying, you know, this patient needs to be reevaluated for the essential function of X, Y, Z. Um, but that being said, the, then you could be evaluated with the therapist and see probably still insurance is going to deny because insurance isn't considering anterior tilt at this time. So they're probably just going to be like, well, we're not covering anterior tilt anyways. So we're not going to cover a whole new chair anyways. So that unfortunately is like the battle that you'll kind of run into. Now, I'm not saying don't try. I you, you can go to your, like you have your chair that you're in now. So it doesn't hurt to go to your physician. If your physician will write that and advocate for it, it never hurts to try this and, you know, kind of push the system and see what they say. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay. Jim, you had a, a comment. If you have Medicare 
and a supplement, in my case, Cigna, will Cigna pick up the 20%? They typically will. So you always have to see, and I never like want to say for sure, because these insurance companies change their minds, you know, daily on things that we hear as far as what they say they're covering and not covering. But yes, in general, if you have Medicare, Medicare as a primary, you can do the 80, 20, and then the 20 can go to your, your supplemental. Perfect. Yeah. Elizabeth, would you, um, what Elizabeth says was, uh, as an FYI for mother group, she's heard that Medicare is repairing, not replacing after five years. Oh, is that, uh, is that a, <laughs> no, no, <laughs> like, yes, Medicare does have, okay. So Medicare does have fun. So your vendors, when you have a repair, they can bill Medicare to cover that repair. So that is 100% like a thing. But every five years, you qualify for a new chair. So you can go, you have to go through the process of, you know, you have to go to the physician, you have to get your face to face there that says they're recommending you to be evaluated by a PT or OT for power wheelchair. And then you have to go to your seating evaluation or, you know, sometimes your vendors partner with therapists that'll do that eval. And so you, you have to go through that process again, but no, every five years you, you qualify to be assessed for a new mobility device, not just a repair. Jane asks, how critical is the doctor's uh, prescription if they didn't write seating and position? Oh, it's essential. Your doctor basically like, that's what dictates everything is your diet. Unfortunately, your diagnostic codes that your doctor puts in, and then your doctor has to say there's, there is, I'll show you this just in case y'all ever need it. This is my cheat. Cause this is where I worked. Um, so I worked at tier Memorial Harmon, which is a model system. So if you search T I R R, uh, wheelchair seating, let me see what comes up. Um, okay. So if you search tier wheelchair seating clinic and you click on wheelchair mobility assessments, Memorial Herman's the name of the hospital. Mm -hmm. Um, it will actually have on here what you have to have from your physician, what is needed mm -hmm. for a referral. And if your physician has no clue under the sun, what the heck they're supposed to do. This is the prompt. Patient name is here for an evaluation for power mobility device. Patient name has a history of diagnosis. So this is literally what they're looking for, for a physician to write, because a lot of times physicians get confused on what they don't understand what they need to write this for. This is what they write. Mm -hmm. And that, that gives the green light that you need to go be assessed by a seating clinician. And then the clinician is the one who's going to dig into all the details of everything with you on the equipment and your daily routine and your transfers and all of that. The physician, they just have to write this little thing if it's for power. Perfect. Mm -hmm. I have a questions from um, before that people have sent before. So I wanted to address those before I forget. So I have a question from Eddie uh, online that says anything, anything unable to be transferred from a power, sh power chair to a vehicle and back to the wheelchair again. What is the, the best recommendation for that? So um, to like to transport your chair or to transfer you? I, I think it's it. Uh, I think it's transfer the person right, from the from the wheelchair or the power chair to the car. Yeah. So there's different ways. So you can ride obviously as a passenger in a vehicle, or you can yeah. ride as a person seated in your wheelchair in a vehicle. You do have to have a modified van for that, yeah. obviously. If you are transferring, that's where you have to get with a therapist and work on your transfers. Really, the only right. way to get into the vehicle is a sliding board transfer. Um, unless if you have lower, some lower extremity strength and movement, we can sometimes teach a caregiver how to help you with like a squat pivot, or you can pull on, you know, the dread, like the handrail to kind of get in mm -hmm. to the vehicle. Um, so there's different techniques. Now it just takes a lot of practice. Car transfers are probably like the hardest thing to learn at first. And then you'll see, like, if you get on YouTube and look up, you know, um, spinal cord injury transfer into a vehicle, you're going to see people that make it look easy and they're transferring into trucks. Like, I mean, yeah. so it's don't be deceived when you see that it is really hard. People get to that over time. But usually we're starting out with what's called a sliding board. Um, and a therapist would train you kind of how to set up your chair, use that sliding board, 
kind of scoot over or have family help scoot you over into the vehicle. But that's kind of the only way to get into the vehicle is probably through a slide with a sliding board. Yeah, that's a tricky one. And the final one is, do healthcare companies allow you to choose which power share manufacturer to select or what is the process on that? Yes, you have a right to choose, okay? So it depends on what you qualify for. So that's why yeah. I showed you our group three chairs. Diagnostically, yeah. this group would qualify for a group three chair with your diagnosis alone, okay? So you have a neurological condition. So that gets you into that category. Obviously, you need to have other reasons you need a power chair. Um, that's why we talked about that equipment algorithm. You have to rule out that like, oh, these things aren't appropriate. Like, oh, a manual wheelchair wouldn't be appropriate because we have reduced upper extremity function. We're fatigued. We're not able to perform daily tasks because we're too tired. It's not timely. So you rule those things out to get to power. Now, when you get to that group three category, like our chairs are considered, you know, group three complex rehab chairs. You can Google group three power wheelchairs. There's tons of companies. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's Quantum, there's Permobile, there's Sunrise, there's, you know, a bunch of different ones out there. But what I would say is they are not all created equal. And I'm not saying that in regards to Quantum. I work for Quantum because I yeah. like our chair, but try the chairs. Okay. So that's where I'm saying really advocate for yourself. If you want to try a Quantum and a Permobile, you tell them. I, before I decide, I would like to try these chairs. Either they'll bring those to your wheelchair clinic, depending on kind of your wheelchair clinic setup, or if your vendor has them available, or a lot of times our manufacturer reps are getting scheduled to, hey, you know, Mrs. Smith wants to try a quantum and she's also trying the permobile. So one day the permobile reps taking the chair out there and they're driving it around. And the next day, the, the quantum reps showing up with a chair and driving it around. So you can try these out. Now, they're not going to give them to you for like a week or whatever. It's going to be a pretty short trial, but you'll know when you're yeah. in the chairs, you know, drive them where you want, drive it outside in your driveway or drive it over bumps in your house. And you'll know which one feels right for you and ask about the various features. Um, you know, you can ask about things about their suspension and, and that kind of thing. So you should always be able to try your chair. So it looks to me, Alex and Stephanie, is that the process is really something that you really need to be very involved, kind of figure out how you're going to use your chair, what you need it for, what are the real functions that you really need because it makes a difference? Some of them may be covered, some of them may be more difficult to get them covered. But actually, you need to do your, your due diligence for these type of things because it's a it's a big expense in a way. And you yeah, really well, and just know it's all about you and it's overwhelming. Yeah. So, you know, usually when patients, I, I mean, I worked in inpatient rehab, so I worked with people that were just getting diagnosed with something, something tragic just happened, and we're having to pick a chair. And they're like, what? Like, I, I'm learning about a ventilator and all these other things, or I'm trying to use my hands. And now we're talking about picking a chair. And so a lot of times there is kind of this panic of like, oh, whatever you say, and if you are working, obviously, with a very knowledgeable, knowledgeable ATP and clinician, we're going to tell you our reasons of why we think you should try X, Y, Z. But we're going to try those things. Um, now, little stuff, sometimes like backrest or things like that, you might try a version of it. They may be like, oh, this isn't the size we're going to order. It's going to be different. You know, it's not going to be a perfect fit when you trial things because you're just kind of trialing for the overall feel. And when you get something customized to you, it's going to feel, you know, 10 times better if it's customized to you. Yeah. So just know though, you have that right to trial that equipment and it's okay to say, well, I don't really know. Can I try the other ones? You know, some, yeah. at the, you know, if somebody gets frustrated and they're like, oh, you want to try those? Who cares? You can try them. It does obviously prolong the process. So if you're like, I want my chair in 30 days, well, that's not going to happen. If you're going to try a bunch of things, it, you know, typically chairs from order to you receiving them, a lot of times it's three months. So, you know, it is a process. And so the further you delay, you know, pushing that script through insurance, the longer it's going to take to get your personal chair. But that doesn't mean don't trial things. So you have the right to trial things. And I want to add that, like, adding a few weeks or months to when you get your chair is absolutely nothing in comparison to you're married to your chair for five years. Mm -hmm. You want to try the right chair is, and get them. Um, as a lawyer, I've come across a million people who are wheelchair users who said, I didn't know I had an option. They just came to my house and told me what I was getting. 
don't accept that answer mm -hmm. and do your own research. Every power mobility company has websites that show what options are. You might not qualify for every option based on your disability, but that doesn't mean you don't have a, a choice in what manufacturer you go with, mm -hmm. um, the different things that you might need. And you're better able to advocate for what you need if you know what the options are. Yeah, exactly. So just know really you are in control of this and we're listening to what you want, especially your clinician. If somebody's not listening to what you want, just also know you have a right of provider. So if you're working with a company and you don't like that provider, you have a right to change providers. Okay. So this is really driven by you. If you don't like what's happening or who, what people are telling you, you know, you have a right to advocate for yourself to trial things and you have a right to say, I'm sorry, I'm going to, I would like to work with somebody else. Um, so, you know, just know it, you know, it's all a complicated process and somebody can't magically change insurance. So you might not like somebody because they're saying you can't get it. <laughs> it could be an insurance reason, but I'm saying that they should collaborate. This should be a collaboration mm -hmm. with your provider, your clinician and yourself on what's going to work best for you to use daily. Thank you, Lori. I had a, uh, just a comment about the, um, you know, you were showing some of the devices that can replace the joystick. And I just wanted to make a comment, especially for people with IBM, that there's there's one that you just place your hand on it. Um, I think it was the third device or there there you go. The device on the left. The yeah, the goalpost. Yeah. And and I love that. Um, and I still have dexterity, but I think a lot of IBM patients would find that really helpful in order to manipulate, you know, the, the joystick controls. Yes, this is like a gold standard as you know, for those with difficulties in upper extremity function, specifically your hand or your wrist, they get tired or fatigued. This is kind of the gold standard, this goalpost joystick, because you can really just rest your hand and you can use, you don't have to use, you can use your wrist if you want, but you can really use more of your shoulder to kind of drive with this and not have to like pinch something or hold something. So yeah, that's a really good point, Lori. It really, it does make a difference. So you can conserve your energy too and use your dexterity when you need to. Yeah. And then Alex, do you have a sense of what that anterior tilt option actually costs? Yes. So I do know, you know, the 10 degrees is standard. So basically the way TB4 works is it is, it's basically just like an upgrade to our system. So if somebody's ordering the TB4 system that comes with, you know, tilt, recline, elevate the legs and the 10 degrees of anterior tilt, that's a minor price difference in the base MSRP. I think it's only like $500 different as far as the base MSRP. When you get to 20 degrees, I think that one is around, I want to, I don't want to be wrong, but I think, oh, do I have my little folder right here? The 20 degrees MSRP is a difference of about $2,000. And then the 30 degrees MSRP is $2,595. Wow. You remember, those are MSRP. Right. So right. just know if you talk to a provider and you say, hey, I really want that anterior tilt fit feature, always say, what would I need to pay? Because they usually get these things at a reduced price of some sort. And so what right. they are going to tell you your price is, is not MSRP. Yeah. Yeah. Because I had to pay for the seat elevation and yeah. discount on that. But, you know, yeah, if, seat if elevation, can... it was like we always told patients it's different, like it would be it would cost more if you wanted to get it after the fact versus if you got it early, it is discounted from what that MSRP is. Right, right. Yeah, I, I'm looking at that sit to stand kind of function of that tilt. Yes, because that is the most difficult thing for me, even though I use the elevation and the elevation helps me to get out of the chair. Yes. I can see that as my disease progresses, the ability for that function to be there for me to stand up. Um, yeah. I think that that's, that's really essential. Yeah. And I would say, you know, those transfer handles help if you just have seat elevation, but I think for sure you could fight for it, you know, as things progress and you're needing it for more of those angles to kind of come to that standing position. I think that definitely there is an argument for, you know, the progression and change that, okay, you were previously, you know, able to perform a sit to stand transfer with, you know, whatever level of assistance with the seat elevator over time now that's changed to this. And then if you're able to 
you know, use a trial of the anterior tilt and say, oh, well now with the anterior tilt, I'm able to go back to this level of independence with that. Yeah, that's helpful because that would be the justification. Exactly. And that's what they would look at as the level of assist. And they can also look at various like clinical tests to see like what your balance looks like, what the strength requirements are. There's different stuff they can do to kind of show that change. Right. Yeah. Because my upper body strength to be able to like push off of something is is not there. And so having that ability is going to be yeah, huge. That, I, yeah. yeah, that'll help me to talk with my physician to say exactly these are the these are the criteria that we're going to need to meet to mm-hmm. to get that chair sooner than the five years. Yeah, we have finished all the questions. Thank you so much to Alex and Stephanie for giving us a very good presentation. I learned a lot. Uh, as we prepare to learn from this disease, we know always have to be doing modifications. So there's a lot of things that we bring. Hopefully we can do this, this in a regular basis because as you can see, there is a lot of new things happening. So this is a progressing area. So hopefully we have new advance, advances that come next year and then we have new ad- updates to give to people. And this is kind of the first time we do a whole mobility series for, for people with myositis. So hopefully we can do this in the future. We certainly appreciate all your deep knowledge on the subject and the experience of Stephanie using, using the chair and helping us kind of the real life experience with it. Uh, and I, Lynn, you want to say something else? I just wanted to say it's been thoroughly enjoyable. I appreciate uh, the feedback from everybody who has said thank you, thank you, thank you, Alex and Stephanie, for doing this. I did say this one thing. Don't eat too much at Thanksgiving, but have a great Thanksgiving. And we will see you around the corner. I know we already have some ideas for another in this series. Uh, hopefully in December, if not right after the first of the year. So enjoy your time together over the holiday, and we'll be back. We'll be back in the next session, next one. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Mm-hmm.